Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Ice. I'm a professor of communication and the chair of the communication department. Uh, and just like Catholic Mass, there's plenty of seats in the front. You don't have to be sitting up seats in the back there. But uh, And just like Catholic Mass, I'm going to ask you, turn off your cell phones, okay? Uh, so we don't interrupt the speakers. Uh, tonight's event is sponsored by the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. Uh, tonight we have a student debate with uh, a guest commentary, and the debate resolution is resolved that new communication technologies harm civic engagement. Now this debate uh, has really been a six week long reading course that uh, six students have been participating in. Four of those six are debating here uh, tonight. So they've been reading uh, lots of uh, research on, on this topic to develop the positions that they have. Uh, first, we'd like to have a special thanks to Dr. Kelly Berg, Associate Professor of Communication, for organizing and leading the reading group. And Kelly's here in the front row. Uh, two of the alternates uh, who uh, are not debating tonight, but were very much a part of the discussion throughout the uh, six weeks. Uh, Carrie Vandelak, is she here? Carrie is a uh, junior gender and women's studies major from uh, Oakland, Minnesota. And uh, Kumihiro Shimoji, first year political science major from Okinawa, Japan. The debaters tonight for the affirmative team, believing that new technologies harm civic engagement, uh, Drew Breyer, a first year communication major from Minnetriska, Minnesota, and Faith Zhang, first year political science major from Minneapolis. Uh, on the negative, believing that uh, new technology does not harm civic engagement, Dan Wolgamot, first year political science and Hispanic studies major from Elkhorn, Nebraska. Uh, we won't hold that against him. Uh, yeah. And uh, Sean Lynch. Yeah. Sean, Sean Lynch, a sophomore political science major from St. Cloud, Minnesota. Our respondent tonight is Sean Kershaw, executive director of the Citizens League, uh, and he is the third annual scholar in residence this week at the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement at St. John's University. A little bit about uh, the Citizens League. Founded in 1952, uh, the Independent Nonpartisan Citizen League is one of the nation's premier citizen based good government organizations. The organization is distinguished by its pioneering process that involves citizens in studying public issues and developing policy solutions. Uh, the Citizens League is based in St. Paul and it focuses on public policy issues at the local, metropolitan, and state levels. Over the years, the Citizen League has been one of the most effective agents of change in Minnesota public policy. The Citizens League, League's impact can be seen in areas of public finance, regional government, education, transportation, and health care. The format for tonight's debate will be that we will first hear from the first affirmative speaker. I believe that's going to be Drew. He will speak for 10 minutes, making his, taking his position. Then the first negative speaker, which would be Dan, and he will speak for 10 minutes. Then the second affirmative speaker, Faith, um, and then followed by the second affirmative speaker. And then immediately following those, I'll give them a minute to collect their thoughts. Each team will present a submission. And the way debate works, the order flips, uh, and the negative team will speak first for uh, three minutes and then the affirmative team will speak for three minutes. And then we'll hear from our guest, Mr. Kershaw, who will give his analysis of what happened here tonight. And then we're going to open it up for questions and comments from the audience. I think we're going to have a lively debate and a good discussion. Actually, the winners are going to be all of you uh, hearing all of the controversial points here that 
are going to be brought up by these debaters. Okay? Thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start tonight with a quote um, famously stated in 1999 by then CEO of Cisco Systems, John Chambers. He said, what people have not yet grasped is that the internet will change everything. And change indeed we are experiencing right now. The internet is growing faster than ever. And these, these technologies are, are at our fingertips that we never before thought would be possible. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I do stand here to, to aff affirm the resolution um, resolved. New technologies are harming civic engagement. But I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that these new technologies are evil. Um, I'm not going to tell you that your, your Facebook is bad, but I, I am going to provide some compelling evidence showing how these new technologies are, are inhibiting our levels of civic engagement in society. But before beginning, I'd like to start with, uh, with defining um, some of the terms in this resolution, um, the first of which being new technologies. New technologies are recent developments in collaboration, um, including Web 2.0 web applications that enable users through interactive interfaces to uh, network with each other for various purposes. Um, an example of this would be uh, selling and exchanging goods with uh, services like Craigslist and eBay, um, exploring and, and contributing to enormous banks of information such as uh, Wikipedia and YouTube, and uh, of course uh, networking with friends um, on, on Facebook, um, MySpace and Twitter. And uh, I'd just also like to add that uh, recently um, the Star Tribune announced that Facebook is indeed the number one um, visited website in the world, um, surpassing, surpassing uh, the previously, um, previous highest, that's Google.com. Um, I'd like to move on to the next definition, that's civic engagement. Uh, we're borrowing a definition by Verba, Schlozeman, and Brady, which in their 1995 paper they said, uh, it's that which is intended to or has the consequence of affecting either directly or indirectly government action. So an example of this is a letter to the government, to a government official, uh, protesting, signing petitions, um, vo voting, boycotting, and uh, just in gen general uh, engaging in political discussion. And then uh, lastly, um, of course, negative uh, impact is the assertion that indeed the, uh, the level of civic engagement has declined and, have been, and has been inhibited by the use of such technologies. So our argument is going to go as follows. Um, first, I'd like to demonstrate that indeed the level of civic engagement in society has declined and that our level of consumption of, of media through these new technologies has, has increased. Secondly, I'm going to show you that there's a unique characteristic that, that spurs from the use of these technologies. We are inclined to become more, more polarized on the issues. And then um, thirdly, I'm going I'm to show that um, certainly the, these, um, as, I've, I've, as I've stated earlier, certainly these um, technologies are indeed helpful, but it seems that we're creating an enormous gap between the haves and have-nots of society um, through using these technologies, and, and that um, is undoubtedly a, a negative impact. So uh, let's begin. Um, in, in researching for this, I, I found um, one of the most, um, one of the best explorations of, of this issue is by uh, Robert D. Putnam in an essay entitled uh, Bowling Alone, um, America's Decline of Social Capital. He, uh, he shows us that uh, these technologies are, are clearly affecting the way we, we spend our time. Um, in the past, as, as many of you can attest, um, computers did not play a large role in our lives. In fact, probably some of you even remember a time before, uh, before television. Um, so with the advent of these technologies, we've completely reconfigured the way that we live our lives, and this is having a negative impact on our civic engagement. As, uh, as social critic James Howard Kunstler um, gives, gives his commentary, he says, uh, the physical envelope of the house itself no longer connects or their lives to the outside in any active way. Rather, it seals them off from it. The outside world has become an abstraction filtered through television just as the weather is an abstraction filtered through air conditioning. And we're clearly seeing that, that these, these technologies are taking over our lives. From 1965 to 1995, as Putnam found and stated in his paper, our nation watches one hour more television a night, but this has yielded one quarter less civic engagement, that is, as reported as membership in, in these um, community organizations. So yes, since then we have come a long way since television, but we were experiencing a similar effect from these new technologies. Now Putnam saw this and then he says, our, our, our leisure time is indeed now privatized, but what are the consequences of this? Well, he's found that increased aggressiveness is, is evident in our society. There's a reduced school achievement of our children. Um, it is statistically associated with psychosocial malfunctioning. 
And of course, uh, civic ignorance, cynicism, and ultimately less than civic engagement is a result. But I'm sure you're all asking, are there statistics? Are there statistics to back this up? And yes, I'm proud to say there are. In, uh, in a, a, a paper entitled Social Is Isolation in America, a survey done in 2002, um, the num they found that the number of people which people discuss uh, political issues with has decreased by nearly one. That is, they reported, uh, uh, they previously reported they, they had about three people to discuss with, and this has declined to about 2.8 since 1980. And uh, furthermore, they found that 43.6% uh, of the respondents so that they discuss important issues with no one. In a similar study, they found that uh, only 27% of college freshmen think that keeping up with political affairs is very important, as compared with 59% in, in 1966. So what Putnam is getting at here is that a major commitment to these new technologies is absolutely incompatible with a major commitment to civic life. So we're seeing that this technology use is clearly up and the level of civic engagement is clearly down, but why? Which brings me to my, my second contention, being that uh, there's a polarization of the issues um, that, that is coming from this. Um, the internet, uh, especially specifically blog readership, um, fosters polarization of the issues instead of, of coming together and collaborating uh, in order to, to compromise on the issues. So in, in a study that I, I, um, I found in, entitled Blog Readership, Participation and Polarization in American Politics, done by Farrell, Lawrence, and Sides in 2008, found that blog readers fall into two groups. That is, they are omnivores or, comno, uh, <clears throat> or carnivores. And the omnivores um, of, the, of the group of, of blog readers seek information from both sides of the spectrum. And carnivores only seek and engage in information that they, that, that they already agree with or are likely to agree with. And, and indeed, they're getting nowhere by not seeing what the other side of the issue is. Um, so they did a study, they said, okay, uh, uh, are, are, we in, um, are we devouring a, a carnivorous diet or an omnivorous diet of, um, of our, our uh, media usage? And they found, that over, they found overwhelming evidence that carnivores prevail. Of 16,145 respondents, 94% of those only read blogs from one side of the political sp spectrum. They summarize this in, the, in their study saying, when citizens rely on others to report events to them, rationality decrees that they select those reporters who provide them with various versions of events that closely approximate the versions they would formulate themselves were they an expert on the spot witness. To accomplish this, they must choose reporters whose selection principles are nearly identical by that of their own. And as I stated earlier, this is getting us nowhere. Um, when, we, when we look at blogs from, both, from, from only one side of the spectrum, we're completely losing the other side of the argument, and we're only becoming further polarized in our issues. When people are only becoming more extreme in their issues, there's, there's no um, a positive civic engagement coming from this, and, and, and indeed it is a, a negative impact. So um, many, many people argue that um, the, the common diet um, of, of news is essential to the proper functioning of modern democracy. As, uh, as cited by Bloomer and, and Kanav, Kanav, nah, <coughs> excuse me, Kavanaugh in 1999, um, they say uh, the presumption of mass exposure to relatively uniform uh, political content, um, which has underpinned each of the three leading paradigms of pil political effect, that is one, agenda setting, uh, two, the spiral of silence, and third, the cultivation hypothesis can no longer be taken for granted. We need this common diet uh, per se, of news. It's essential to the proper functioning of our democracy. Which, which brings me to my third point. Um, through these technologies, we are creating and strengthening the digital divide that separates the haves and have-nots. So certainly, the internet is useful, but if it's not available to everyone, we, have clearly, we are clearly experiencing a negative impact from these technologies. In a 2005 study done by the General Accounting Office, there's a random sampling of Americans. They found that 28% of, uh, of, of those sampled have broadband access, 30% have dial-up, and 42% of them have no access at all. So what we are seeing here is, is that many would suppose that internet retrieval and communication costs are plummeting, but given the remoteness of some areas and the price of, of, of getting online, the retrieval and communication <clears throat> the retrieval and communication costs of these technologies is, in, is indeed um, um, skyrocketing. So in, a, in an article published, A Man, A Plan, A Problem, The Internet, um, by, by Tim Carr, this is published uh, through the Free Press on March 17, 2010, so quite recently, he found that there's three major issues with uh, internet usage and the digital divide. <clears throat> 
He found that uh, we, have, we have fewer choices of internet. Um, High-speed users are left with, with very little choice in the political, in, in the marketplace for where they're getting their internet access from. In a, a study done by the FCC, they found that 5% uh, of households have no wireless access at all, 13% of households have access to one, and 78% of them have, have access to just two wireless providers of internet. So in other words, 96% of the country has two or fewer choices to, to get their internet from. And, and this, is, uh, this is clearly a negative impact. Uh, this is clearly ne negatively impacting um, civic engagement because if we're, if we're left with just two, two choices, this is, this is harmful. Um, secondly, slow speeds of access uh, compared to the rest of the world is, is also um, present in our, our nation. Um, the US, US broadband uh, averages about four to five uh, megabits a second for, for their connections. Whereas Japan and Hong Kong both offer speeds of 100 megabits a second and, and they offer this for about $13 a month. Um, this is, we clearly need to get on par with them in, in order to, to uh, turn around our, our levels of, civ civ <coughs> of civic engagement. Uh, and lastly, uh, high, pres high prices of internet access. Um, uh, there's a Pew study in 1999 that found that there were, uh, um, as there, there were many fewer choices for broadband, um, our prices are skyrocketing. And, and um, this, is, uh, this is clearly a negative impact on civic engagement. Because certainly we can stand up here and say that, yes, these technologies are very helpful. But if they're only available to, you know, 46% of, of the population, then, um, or as, as so cited in this study, then we have a problem here. So uh, essentially, I have uh, proven that uh, there is indeed a negative impact suffered because uh, we've discovered that the use of these technologies is up and the civic level of civic engagement in our society has declined. We have found that we were becoming polarized on these issues by not working through them through the use of these technologies. We have found that there is a, a strengthening, we are strengthening a digital divide between the haves and have nots of our nation. Um, and this is why I urge an affirmative ballot uh, in this debate. Thank you. New technology does not harm civic engagement, but in fact enhances it by enhancing citizens' abilities to communicate, organize, and access information. New technology provides powerful tools of communication, powerful enough, in fact, to start a revolution. In 2001, the citizens of the Philippines were dissatisfied with their current president, Joseph Estrada, Sick and tired of his corrupt administration, his use of bribery, and his habit of womanizing, these Filipinos wanted Estrada removed from office. But to do so, these fed up Filipinos needed a means of communication that was inexpensive and unable to be censored by Estrada's government. They needed new technology. They needed text messaging. The Filipinos used text messaging to spread stories of Estrada's corruption from island to island to island. And the more the stories spread, the more inspired they were to get out and protest. Eventually, they became so disgusted from the text they were reading that millions of them assembled at the presidential palace, decked out in black t-shirts, demanding that Estrada be removed from office. Their protests were a success, and on January 20th, 2001, Joseph Estrada was impeached. After hearing the good news that Estrada was out of the presidential palace for good, a middle-aged Filipino woman said this to Richard Perry, who was writing for The Independent. Quote, this is my second revolution, and it's been so much better than the first. Faster, more spontaneous, and a younger crowd. And none of it could have happened without text messaging, end quote. Now, that's a global example of new technology's ability to enhance civic engagement, but one need look no further than right here in our very own state of Minnesota to see how civic engagement is enhanced through new technology. Care 11 Sunrise, a news website based in the Twin Cities, features local events and organizations that are active in the community and provides a direct means of communication between the citizens and the organizations so that local community-based civic engagement may occur. For example, on March 9th, the top story on CARE 11 Sunrise featured the open arms of Minnesota, 
a charity that distributes nutritious meals for people with chronic and life-threatening illnesses. The story informs readers of the community's impact, directs the readers to a website, and provides a link for them to share with all their friends on Facebook. Now, this Facebook sharing deal is an important thing because as the representative for Open Arms of Minnesota said in the story, quote, we depend on volunteers to put together and distribute our materials, end quote. Now, how is it that charities like Open Arms of Minnesota recruit volunteers and notify them of events? Well, they can depend on old technology where you have to go and spend all the time and money getting a bunch of envelopes and stamps and labels and writing out, typing out the letters and stuffing the envelopes and going to the post office and waiting two or three days for it to ship out to everybody. Or they can utilize new technology and notify its hundreds of fans on Facebook for absolutely free at the click of a mouse. It's as easy as that. And thanks to Facebook, not only are volunteers recruited and notified, but they're also provided a forum to post their feedback, thoughts, ideas, opinions, and converse about the events. Sean Kershaw uses Facebook as a, as a tool to communicate with members of Citizens League and says that the social networking site, quote, connects people together and moves them from passive to productive. New technology has gotten so many volunteers from the open arms of Minnesota from passive to productive that it just received an $800,000 grant to create a bigger building for its expanding group of volunteers. My second point is that new technology enhances civic engagement by enhancing organization. In fact, the tea party and coffee party revolutions are brewing at this very moment. And and thanks to new technology, they're ready to boil. <laughs> the Tea Party has used the internet to create a small series of websites that connects conservative citizens with a distrust for the government. This movement is showing definite signs of success. Back in February, the Tea Party held its first national Tea Party convention in Tennessee. The Washington Post reports that the event sold out at over 1,000 attendees, each paying $549 for a ticket. To put up that kind of money, you must really want to get civically engaged. In that famous anti-government protest that happened back in 1773 in Boston, was it the last Tea Party victory to be won in Massachusetts? The Tea Party leaders today take credit for Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown's surprising victory in the January 2010 election. Colleen Conley, the Rhode Island Tea Party president, said this of the event to the Boston Herald, quote, Scott Brown winning this election is a shot heard around the world for our Tea Party movement. But tea isn't the only civically engaged beverage new technology is pouring into the cups of citizens. The Coffee Party, under the mission of wake up and stand up, is organizing liberals with a trust for the government by creating a website and organizing through Facebook. Today, the Coffee Party boasts uh, over 180,000 members of its Facebook group a number that continues to increase by the thousands every day. The local chapters are using Facebook to plan nationwide meetings from Washington to San Antonio, all the way out to Los Angeles. And although this movement is still in the early growing stages, new technology promises to provide it the ability to continue to organize and expand. But political parties aren't the only ones that are using new technology to enhance civic engagement through organization. Charities are becoming high-tech also. For example, back in January 2009, a disastrous and tragic earthquake struck in Haiti. And it was new technology to the rescue. The Red Cross created a text messaging program to raise funds to provide aid to the earthquake victims. So instead of using old technology to whip out the checkbook and take the time to write out the check and put it in the envelope and put the stamp on the envelope and send it out in the mail, all citizens had to do was text Haiti to 90999, and bam, just like that, $10 was donated to help those Haitian earthquake victims. At the flick of a thumb, it's as easy as that. My third and final point is that new technology enhances civic engagement by providing citizens with easy access to information. Is anybody in here curious about that new legislation to reform Medicare and Medicaid? Well. 
Log on to regulations.gov, one of many e-rule-making websites that provides an unprecedented amount of access by allowing citizens to read rules and regulations from over 300 federal agencies. And then post their thoughts and feedback. Is anybody in here curious about where their taxpayer dollars are going to fund that big honking $787 billion stimulus package Congress passed in 2009? Well, log on to recovery.gov, which tracks the spending of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, that big honking stimulus package, and gives taxpayers user-friendly tools to track where and how their money's being spent through charts and graphs and maps. And the website also reports suspected fraud, waste, or abuse, therefore enhancing civic engagement by enhancing citizens' abilities to hold the government accountable. The ability to access information provided new technology is enhancing youth civic engagement. For example, back in 2008, for the presidential election, CNN and YouTube teamed up to create a series of debates to engage young citizens who are more frequent watchers of YouTube and less frequent re readers of the New York Times to try to spark some interest in the election. Circle, a research center at Tufts University, reports that 54.5% of eligible voters between the ages 18 to 29 got off their butts and got out the vote. This is a historically high turnout. In fact, it's a 6% increase from year 2004 and a 13% increase from the year 2000. Now, to me, a 13% increase in youth voter turnout doesn't sound like civic engagement's being harmed. This statistic, along with all the other examples that I've shared with you today, offers concrete evidence that new technology does not harm civic engagement but in fact enhances civic engagement by providing citizens with the ability to communicate, organize, and access information. As Pum, uh, Robert D. Putnam questioned it, why are more Americans bowling alone? Putnam also written, disengagement is not limited to voting, but also affects almost every form of civic collective activities and institution, say fundamentalist religion, and a rise in temporary volunteerism, driven at least in part by compulsory requirements for service activities in schools, in schools and colleges. Because America are not civically engaging the way they did 10 years ago or 20 years ago due to new technology including Web 2.0 such as Facebook, MySpace, YouTube, Wikipedia, and all these social sources that are neg negatively impacting the way people engage politically. Now I'm going to defend three contentions today on how new technologies have a negative impact on civic engagement. One. They further create a divide among the haves and have-nots with unequal distribution of the news. Two, the internet, specifically blog readership, foster polarization on the, issue, on, the, on, on the issue instead of coming together and compromise on the issue. And three, we are rewiring in ways in which we process information for the worst. Civic engagement is down. And why do I say this? Part of the problem is that according to Putnam 2000, if we examine ourselves, not our inspiration, and if we compare ourselves not with other countries, but with our parents, the best available evidence suggests that we are less connected with one another. As I heard clearly from Dan's speech, the argument in defining new technologies, that one, it improves communication, two, it, um, new technology increases organizations, and three, it allows people to access political information on new technologies. These claims may be right to an extent. However, there are several reasons why these claims are wrong. In the social implication internet, Dimag Dimaggio et al. 2001 quoted that, lowering the economic cost to initiate and sustain an accessible political voice can lower access barrier to monetary voices as well. This proves that your claim to improve communication or to increase organi organization and access information 
is incorrect because people without these new technology lack the resources and therefore does not acquire these points that Dan has just made. According to Bruce Bimmer, professor of the University of California, he stated that because the effort to acquire information depends on the cost of accessible information, which goes back to my first contention that new technology creates a divide amongst the haves and have-nots in the undistribution of news. As on Counting and Bimmer's article, the greatest of digital divide are based on income and education. The rich and the more educated the people are, the more they will use the internet as a political resource. The lower income and less income, the lack resource that they will use, the lack resource that they will use, and therefore will not use political, uh, will not use internet or cell phones as a political resource. In addition to that, the richer and the more educated person is, they are more likely to be conservative, and this therefore is um, political polarization. Statistically, from Washington, D.C. Congressional Quarterly Press, 2008, 38% of those who earn 75000 or over a year are particularly conservative, whereas 31% are liberal. 37% of those who are college graduates are conservative, whereas 30% are liberal. In this case, it's my second contention. The use of new technologies orients citizens to become politically polarized. For example, according to Freeman in Sears 1965 and Frey 1986, the conservatives search, watch, and only listen to conservative sources while liberals do the same and therefore expose themselves to the opposing views. People are either right-winged or left-winged. There are very little in between. These include blog authors or blog readers. Blog authors and blog readers are either right-winged or left-winged. They only go to preferred blogs in which they are affiliated by the political parties. According to Eric Lawrence, John Sides, and Henry Farrell in their article Self-Segregation and Deliberation, Blog Readership Participation and Polarization in the U.S. stated that blog readers intentionally visit their preferred blogs or blogs and visit non-preferred blogs only when they click on the link that, have, that they have encountered elsewhere. As Drew had said earlier, overwhelming evidence that carnivores prevailed out of 16,145 respondents, 94% consumed blogs from one side of the political spectrum only. People do only attend media that reinforce their prejudice. As Tabor and Lodge 2006 concluded, as predicted by the selective exposure hypothesis, hypothesis Participants, especially political sophisticated, were significantly more likely to read the arguments on sympathetic sources than to expose themselves to an exposing, opposing point of view. Moreover, they polarized as a result of their selective exposure. Another reason why, why new technology is politically polarizing and that new technology has a ne negative impact on civic engagement is that young people are becoming more liberal. In the, in the research of Pew Internet American Life Project, Young voters tilt towards Obama, specifically in towards the Democrats generally, and that gives the Democrats some online advantages. In the Pew Center research, a non-government public leaders who had the qualities they had most admired. Excuse me. In the Pew Center research, in 2006, midterm election for con Congress, young people voted overwhelmingly for Democrats over Republicans by 58% to 37% among all that are the age between 18 to 24. This proved that the claim that technology allows, organ allows people to, um, allows organization to expand politically and within the community, it's only fostering polarization in, on political issues instead of collaborating together on the issue. And my third intention, People rewire information for the worst to the use of new technology, especially the young generation. In Bimber's article, research in early media, however, indicates that individuals tend to be aware of the most popular culture articles and to monitor the latest hot programs and motion picture. People are most aware of the most interesting and eye-catching thing, but they forget the most important thing. They forget these political nooses. New technology only make people less informed about the world, especially the local level. Young people are also affected by this because of the negative impact that new technology have on them. Young people are focusing less on political issue or life. They spend more time on entertainment than on the news. From Close Up Foundation, in recent survey, a majority of the high school students cannot name a single government or non-government public leader who had the qualities they most admired. 
and said, as found by the Pew Center research, when asked to name someone who they admired, roughly twice as many young people say they most admire an entertainer or other, more than a political leader. Due to new technologies, young people spend less time following the news. Instead, they go on Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, YouTube, and all these social sources that are limited in political views or news in, in the worldwide, both the worldwide and the local. They will only participate unless they are told to do so, asked to do so, or forced to do so. It follows that they are less well informed about the current events and therefore it proves that new technologies are not helping people to be civically engaged. It all concludes back to Putnam's question, why are more Americans boldly alone? Because new technology brings down civic engagement. I'm not saying that civic engagement is bad, but I'm saying that the improvement in communication, the increase of organization, and the access to information does not help people to be civically engaged. Because people are divided among the haves and have nots, which is not productive or allowing those that do not have a voice have an opinion. The lower income and the less educated persons, they will lack the resources in which they will not acquire this information. They will not be able to acquire this information. And therefore, it does not improve communication. It does give access to information, but it's founded in Fountain 2001 and Ben Bember 2002. They stated that new technology can enhance information to the people and make it easy for the government but it risks new forms of inequality and undistribution of news among the people and their relation with the states and their political views. People are politically polarizing by what they believe. Either they are right-winged or left-winged, which is not productive. In addition, rewinding our information is for the worse. Youth are wrongly using technologies. Instead, they seek entertainments and not political news, which they become less informed about current events and therefore proves to you that new technology have a negative impact on civic engagement. As Daniel and I have discussed thus far tonight, social media, media has proven itself a key instrument in the way that we move forward towards civic engagement. However, there are, as always, critics of this new medium. We must remember, though, that an intern or that <clears throat> we must remember, though, that an internal release by the Western Union in 1876 stated that upon the public release of the telephone, that this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Further, film representative Daryl Zanuck scoffed in 1946 that people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night when television was released. There's always going to be resistance to change in progress in the way that we process and share information, and social media is no exception. First, critics are quick to cry foul at the supposed death of localized or info-based journalism, but this of course relies on the false pretense that citizens will not bring their local community to the shared table of information that is social media. Indeed, we are moving towards a global village in terms of knowledge and ideas, but it is laughable that citizens will abandon their roots upon gaining global perspective. Further, local news branches are likely to benefit from less pressure on nationalized news media, because it is their local reporting which has not degraded in quality as larger news companies move toward the polarizing and entertainment-driven stories of today. According to the report from, on the state of the new media conducted by the Pew Research for Project in Journalism, in, newspapers watched as revenues declined 26% in 2009, a crucial part of their business model. Further, as major newspapers have declined, local and regional news has successfully bridged the divide and begun to increase revenue us, utilizing the internet, as evidenced by Chuck Linotti's 2009 article in Analyzing Publishing Technologies. Localized and regional papers have begun to succeed in this new market because of the lower prices charged for online advertising, as it is inherent to inherently unlimited. Thus, local businesses appreciate the new accessibility and freedom that they have, as opposed to limited and thus more expensive ad space in print news. Two, other critics claim that a digital divide will form, marginalizing the elderly and those without easy access to the internet from the information marketplace. This again is dependent on the false pretense that public libraries do not have computers with internet access. Further, according to the research conducted in 2009 by the Pew Internet and American Life Project, 79% of adults used the internet in 2009, up from 67% in 2005, 
and 46% of adults utilize social networking sites already. The trend is easy to see and use is growing incredibly quickly among adults. There are no racial tendencies for the social networker and the study concluded that both adults and youth are flocking to social networking sites. The larger portion of users indeed is younger, but that is because they continue to link up and have the head start on their parents. However, according to the American government published in 2009, the rate at which adults are starting to use the internet to obtain political information is rapidly growing. In the 2008 presidential race, Roughly 42% of adults said that they use the internet and social media to obtain information about the campaigns, and voters above the age of 50 who use the internet to learn about the race doubled between the 2004 and 2008 elections. Simply put, adults and the elderly aren't yet making the leap across the digital divide, but they are gathering steam and the numbers are likely to keep growing with, as the generation age and today's youth becomes tomorrow's adults. Three, there are those who don't believe in the American public's ability to get along with each other. That is to say that social media will cause a further polarization of the minds because people will supposedly only seek out the information which appeals to them and their way of thinking. This of course is also false. Studies conducted by the Pew Research Center in 2005 indicate that nearly 40% of Americans have become cynical in their view of the mainstream media, even believing that it hurts our democracy. Another study by the Pew Research Center in 2007 indicates that citizens blame the news media for a perceived erosion of democratic ideas and a purported bias, as well as the well-known trend toward infotainment. The 2007 study states that roughly 55% of survey respondents believe that organizations carry a political bias in their reporting, and 53% of those believe that the stories are often inaccurate. And the ratings indicate that people are not tuning into the talking heads on political TV shows that cause these polarization evidenced by Keith Olbermann's enormous rating drop in, in January of 2010. On the other side of the political spectrum, Fox News was celebrated by the Los Angeles Times on October 26 for a supposed 8% spike in ratings after their pu public criticism of President Obama. But later evidence indicates that the numbers did not change at all during the supposed two-week inflation. Why then would citizens begin to seek out partisan materials on the internet when they are not tuning in on TV? Simply put, social media and the evolution of the internet have enhanced our ability to bridge the political gap, which Fiorina suggested in his book Culture War was never there to begin with, except among media personalities and political elites. In conclusion, social media has most definitely taken its share of flack as it becomes a reliable and crucial part of our daily lives. However, it is important to remember that as with all change, there are those who are resistant to progress. Fortunately, these critics indeed are wrong. The main arguments that they cite against new media are all inherently flawed, from the supposed death of localized journalism to the myth of a digital divide, and the supposed further polarization of our citizenry. Thank you. New technology is not harming civic engagement. I mean, local journalism isn't dying. Ad revenues for nationalized newspapers are decreasing far worse than they are for localized newspapers. And there's no digital divide between the haves and the have-nots because, let's face it, last time I checked, it's not like all the libraries have got some kind of universal ban against people called have-nots. They can all go access a public library anytime they want. And civic, the civic atmosphere isn't becoming more polarized. Just as 55% of Americans re, uh, surveyed by Pew Research who believe that it's the news organizations and not the new technology that's polarized. And not only is new technology not harming civic engagement, it's enhancing it. By enhancing communication, remember the Philippines with their text messaging starting the revolution, in the open arms of Minnesota, using Facebook to recruit and, and notify members, but also by enhancing organization, the coffee party and the tea party, using Facebook and the internet to brew up revolutions. And it's enhancing access to information by having government transparency websites with e-rulemaking that enhance civic engagement by enhancing people's ability to hold the government accountable. And, the, and YouTube and CNN coming together and and doing things to spark interest in the youth. All of our lives are becoming more and more technological, and it's time that we embrace it. Because as a result of all the examples that Sean and I have shared with you this evening, 
it's clear that new technology does not harm civic engagement, but in fact, enhances it by enhancing citizens' abilities to communicate, organize, and access information. New technologies are harming our level of civic engagement. <laughs> Dan, that's all fine and dandy. Yes, I, I do agree that there are uh, many benefits that come from the use of these technologies. But I do still stand to say that there are three specific problems that I've outlined with, the levels of, uh, with these technologies that is leading to a decrease of our level of civic engagement. Our, our first contention being uh, the polarization of the issues, and, and I think standing as the, the, the paragon of, of this uh, contention is my roommate, uh, Josh Gross. Uh, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about my roommate, Josh. He, uh, he is the most conservative person I have ever met in my life. Uh, Pro-war, he, he thought the world was ending the other day when the health care bill was passed. Any argument you have, he's always taking the conservative side. And um, I returned uh, to, my, to my room from class the other day, and I saw Josh uh, with his bulky headphones on uh, in front of his, his television with, uh, with bug eyes, paying attention to what he's, what he's watching. And I said, Josh, what, uh, what are you watching there? He was all, what I usually watch, you know? There's a problem with this. Josh isn't looking at the other side of the spectrum. There are other arguments out there. And when you forget these, there's a problem there. We're not collaborating on these issues. And we need to for there to be an effective uh, uh, level of civic engagement. Secondly, there is indeed, Dan, a, a digital divide evident here um, um, because of these technologies. Um, if grandma in, in some uh, um, town, in some, some mountainous town in Colorado doesn't have access to the internet, then, then there's a problem here. People need access to these technologies, and it is clear through, through my previous evidence that, that I've given that, that not all people have access to this, and, and this is a problem. And uh, thirdly, um, a point that, uh, that Faith touched on a bit is, is that um, these technologies are indeed rewiring um, the capacities of our brain to take in this, these new media. And um, to be honest, this is, is why I decided to be in this debate. Um, in in, a, in a, um, an article um, entitled, uh, Is Google Making Us Stupid? by Nicholas Carr, he starts out and he says, you know, a, a while ago I, uh, I could sit down and I could read a book. I could read a book and I was very um, uh, involved in the process. I could, I could sit down and, and just digest all the information, critically analyze the information that came from, from books, articles, and, and the rest of, of the, the type of, of um, technology that or the type of literature that wasn't new technology. And he says, now it's like, you know, I, I sit down on the internet and there's blinking, flashing ads, and there's all these, these, uh, these gadgets and, um, and, and things that are distracting me from critically engaging in what I'm reading. And this is a problem. These new technologies are, are harming our level of civic engagement by, by rewiring our brains and, and not allowing us to, to think critically about the issues. So uh, that is why I stand to, uh, to affirm um, the, the resolution. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to present the uh, 2010 uh, Scholar in Residence for the Eugene McCarthy Center, Sean Kershaw. The first advice I'd give anybody in public speaking is look very closely at who you follow and never follow people that are better than you. So I should have gone first in this. Uh, um, how many, just a, a poll from the audience, how many people would rather go to the dentist than give up and make an argument in front of a bunch of people you don't know? All right, it's, I mean, it's an enormous fear. It takes an enormous amount of guts to do this. Um, so I want to congratulate again the folks. And it's, and it's much harder in front of your peers. I mean, it, it's much harder to, to, to do this in front of your peers than in a group of strangers. Um, how many people learned something today that they didn't know coming into it? How many, how many people's opinions were changed? Not necessarily that you changed from one side to the other, but that moved somewhere along that spectrum. Okay, good. I think, um, I think that more than anything else 
uh, is, is a sign of the success today. And I mean, I'll add some thoughts, but one of the points I've been saying over and over again in the, in the people that have been stuck in class with me is that the best definition of democracy that I ever got was a professor named Michael Hartunian, and he described democracy as an argument. So it's an argument between competing good things um, and that are always in tension with each other. And I think we saw tonight that there's not necessarily a black or white, it's democracy plays out as an important argument in that gray area. So I, I say, first of all, that was a great example. Second, I have to cite one of the best debaters I know that came from this institution, and that's John Brandle. Um, and that um, at one of the uh, um, uh, events that we had in honor of John before he passed, Roger Moe, who was the state uh, majority leader in the Senate, um, said, I think one of the, the best things about John, he said, you, um, you never ever knew what John was gonna say when he got to microphone. Um, to close an argument, but you were always sort of sorry if you were on the other side of that when he was done, because he was always unpredictable in what he would say, and just did a phenomenal job of sort of arranging the data to make whatever point he was gonna say. So I think, um, I, as coming from this institution, this is a, um, a good example of that. I thought, I thought every, I mean, to comment on the presentations, I thought everybody used your own personal styles to your benefit. I mean, you're each clearly four different people, and I think there, you each use your personal style to your benefit. So there was, I think that played really well. Drew, I think your defining of the terms right away was great. I mean, it's common for people to throw out stuff and you're not sure what it means. Um, I think that you said, and you started off saying, here's what I'm gonna do, and you went back and say, here's what I did. I will give you bonus points. I was gonna offer this as a criticism, and you hit it, that um, the summation point you made, I think wrapped up some of the data in a really great way. So that it actually, one of my criticisms was, was gonna be, this is an argument where a lot of the data, if your eight, data is 18 months old, it's kind of out of date. Um, and the, the Google piece you brought from the Atlantic, I thought was a really good, closer, because it, it tied up that data. Even, I mean, right or wrong, it was, it was good. Um, Dan, I think your use of examples was perfect, because it, it I mean, uh, over and over again, people have a hard time putting this in context, and so I think to use those examples and the energy you brought to it, um, I, think it's, uh, I think that was great. I think that was fantastic, because it, it puts it in context. Faith, I think you're, just from an intellectual standpoint, when you talked about the rewiring, aspect of this that I think, um, first of all, you did a great job refuting the points that were before you. And I think um, if we we're gonna have another debate, I'd love to have a conversation about how technology is re rewiring kids' brains because we're, we're turning out these animals that are um, wired differently and you're not quite sure how. So I thought that was a really effective point. And I think tying the income ideology age things together um, worked really well and Sean, um, Aside from the benefits on the name, um, I think that you use data really well. That the tie to history, because I think one of the most important points is, you know, if you look back in time, and people always say telephone was bad, telegraph was bad, these things. I think even if you're not sure what's going to happen, that's an effective point to be made. Um, and I, I don't, um, I don't know what I would add to this. I, I think, um, I think, in the case of the affirmative. The concern is a lot of the data is not that new, except for your last one. But when all the data ain't good, that's a problem. I mean, so some of the data is not new, but most all of it's in your favor um, over time. Um, and we don't know, the, the point about rewiring is a huge deal. We, this is, you're handing a tool to a new animal and you're not quite sure what's gonna happen. Um, I think, um, and the negative, the your use of current data, you're, and the point that you made that social media is different than blogs was really great. I mean, I think one of the things we forget is social media is really different than what came before it. Um, and I think, again, your use of examples was really good. So I don't, I mean, this was, I think it was a great discussion, it was a great debate, it was clearly a lot of work was put behind it. Um, and so I don't, I don't know how much I can add to that other than um, I think it's a good point to get into the conversation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna take a few minutes here to ask, uh, ask some questions. And I'd like to start off with the first question to Sean, because you use technology for civic engagement. So from the issues that were raised in the debate, especially the issues of the divide and things like that, how, how, how do we start to deal with, from a public policy issue, the issue of the divide and getting everybody involved? So if I can step out of my mind. Yeah, you're not the moderator now. I'm asking you. I'm putting you. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, I'll pretend that's on. Um, I think the digital divide.
online is, is becoming less and less and less of a problem. I think that it's clearly um, when people are buying cell phones before they buy food for their kids in some instances. I think at the most basic text level, that's not, that's rapidly going away. I think the key question is how it's impacting people. I mean, their behavior. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so it's not the access. So you're giving a chisel to somebody and they can make some great piece of woodwork like is all over the place here or they can do damage to something. So I don't think it's the, I think the access is quickly going to go away. I was involved in information technology in the 1990s and the changes are dramatic since then. Mm -hmm. So you, you think, it, oh. it sounds like you, you're still troubled by the wiring issue that, that people are thinking well, differently. And, and, and I think what, what matters is the tool holder. I mean, the intent and the capacity and the skills of the tool holder. So if people are taught to communicate well, if they're taught to not scream, I mean, uh, Drew did a good job of saying right away this, the other side is evil. I mean, so that if, if um, we're using old technologies in the Senate, and I don't think Sunday night you saw the best example of um, debate there. And so I think it's not always the tool, it's the tool holder. So mm -hmm. my hope and my concern is the skills and the culture and the attitude that people bring to that. I think what, what, um, what I think is unique about social media is that it's different than blogs and that it puts people in a contributor role. And if, and if I'm a jerk on my Facebook page, people will befriend me. Um, I mean, if you notice now, one of the biggest... I'm, I'm fast, I mean, it's sort of like the worst of junior high, but there's a good part of this socially, that if you're defriended, that's horrible. Um, that's actually an okay social thing. I mean, it's sort of trying to bind people together. On blogging, the whole point was to tick off as many people as you could. I mean, it was sort of, the goal was defriending in that, in that matter. So, I, mm -hmm. um, again, I think it still depends on what the intent is of the, of the person with the tool. Any questions from audience members? Questions from audience members for anybody? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure that uh, that, that uh, applies to civic engagement. Um, I think that's more of a uh, of a legal, you know, personal rights issue. Should employers be able to look into their employees? Um, I think that's more of a kind of a business management thing um, than it is civic engagement. Um, I, uh, based on the, the things we read and the things we've discussed. Uh, we didn't look too much into employees and, and uh, employers and the employees' rights, so um, I guess I, I don't really, uh, I can share with you my own personal opinion based off of no real research or fact. <laughs> I don't think you want to hear that. Um, so, so I apologize for not answering your question, but I just don't feel that it necessarily involves civic engagement, which is what, um, what this is kind of, what, what we researched and what I kind of know a little bit of stuff about. So thank you for the question, though. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely an absolute concern. Um, and I, uh, I'll go back to what Sean said about somebody using the, um, the chisel. You know, the person has a chisel in their hand, they can go and, and create the Statue of Liberty, or they can go and create the Texas, uh, the check, the Texas picket massacre, you know? Um, I, think that, I think that no matter, you know, everything can be used for, you know, for good, like a, like a good revolution to get out a, a corrupt uh, official, or it could be used for, um, for rumors and, you know, like what you talked about, something that could go too fast. It was not a legitimate, uh, legitimate cause to revolt. Um, that's more of an issue of, um, you know, who is it that's holding the, the, the pickaxe? Who is it that's holding the cell phone? Um, and so, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely that's a concern. Um, but I, I feel that that could be a concern for any number of tools or, or instruments that we have in our possession. 
Um, it's not the instrument itself, but it's the it's the person and the um, and the intent that they're going to use it for. Um, you know, new technology can be used for good or bad. Um, I feel that it enhances civic engagement, and I feel that true. It is a definite concern that civic engagement could uh, uh, could be enhanced in a negative way, but that's not new technology's fault. Thank we, I'll, I'll add some. We actually had an example of that. Was everybody aware of the Supreme Court example? Uh, a law professor uh, announced at the beginning of his class that uh, the Supreme Court justice was going to resign. This happened last week. And, uh, and then went on with the lecture. And students started texting people and then stopped at the end of the lecture and said, oh, by the way, that's false. But by the time, by that one hour, the Supreme Court had to call a press conference to announce that that was wrong because it was already out on all the wires. So that's how quickly the information can pass. Now, I'm not making judgment about what happened there, but the point is we have a real life example. Now, that, I think the story is still posted on, uh, the, on public radio for that, right? You're aware of that story, right? Yeah. I, I saw it in the rumor phase. Mm -hmm. I never saw it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. One thing that actually happened real recently is the FCC or the FTC, one of the two, announced plans that they are going to um, release broadband wires across most of the country, uh, which is going to take care of the proximity issue pretty effectively. Um, in terms of people affording internet access, um, it's just gonna it's gonna take time for the technology to become affordable for the lines to literally be physically laid. Um, and until that happens, yeah, there is going to be somewhat of a gap <coughs> between the haves and the have-nots. But over time, as the infrastructure gets built and the technology becomes cheaper, then we should see things even out quite a bit more. Is on um, to note that uh, the, the provider that's actually uh, undertaking that. Um, Giving lines to the entire country, uh, Google. Um, they, they just got that approved, so um, they're, they're gonna uh, try and become a, um, a provider that, that puts us on par with, uh, like I said earlier, Japan and Hong Kong, who have internet uh, speeds of 100 megabits a second, which is like 10, 15 times faster than what we're currently experiencing um, for, for much cheaper. So that's yeah. What's Very good point, but I also think that uh, it's kind of ignorant to just say, okay, well, we're going to give this to some people and we're going to give this, or we're not going to allow others to have it. So um, to, to say there's not a bigger supply is, is yeah, that's, that's just not true. Um, yeah, I, just, I was just wondering, like, how the digital divide pertains to this debate as in, like, the digital divide between the people who are using the internet. Well, because it is a, it's an awesome tool. I mean, civic engagement is it's clearly. Uh, um, being heightened by these technologies, but um, we're saying that, that yes, it is helpful in, in aiding this, but uh, if it's not available for everyone, then, uh, then we have half the country who isn't able to experience this um, new level of civic engagement. So that, in turn, is, is a, a negative impact. Yeah. Right, I mean, it is, it is, it will be 
postulate argument because uh, um, we're seeing that there, there's companies such as Google, like we, we just talked about, there, it, it is going to be available to much to a much larger portion of the population um, uh, very soon. So um, yeah, that, that is definitely a, a flawed argument. Um, but, uh, but yes, we, we need to be talking about this now so that this happens faster um, rather than later. Yeah. Um, I have a question to the negative about um, human relationships that I don't know if it was um, really addressed that the affirmative brought up. But often it's about um, a political divide and people that blog or the people that um, will say political things on social networks usually feel strongly about a certain way and then instead of um, communicating and coming up with solutions that fall into the middle, like Fiorino stated, that most people are in the middle. They don't typically get those conversations and they, which, looking back in history, I feel like it's a like core part of democracy is that conversation or like you look at caucuses and how how so fundamental democracy is there with the people and you know, moving this spots and those type of things. So um, I guess I would ask what how the negative would repeat that point about um, making it more polarized and less democratic in relationships. Um, like the arena said, um, the average person isn't really that interested in the butting heads and the arguing the polarized discussion. So I feel like the newer technology is going to give people a little bit better avenue to have that more moderate discussion and to push for the more moderate candidates. Um, and in terms of civic engagement, just being able to get involved in their community rather than it having to go to a more mainstream news media, it has to appeal to a larger audience, so it can't really get people involved on that local level, which is really the I definitely agree with that, um, the second point. Um, I just think it may be a really good idea. Maybe you guys have researched some of this of how to get um, that moderate view or the, the communication point of that within using social networks, which would totally make sense. But right now, I feel like in the past you know, couple of years, it's been very polarized. So if there's a way to make it not as much, I think. Thank you. Absolutely. It, I think it's just a matter of there isn't really the research on whether there's whether the Facebook and Twitter are going to give people that avenue for that moderate discussion. We're just more saying that they have the potential to do so. Well, and, and what we do know is, is back to what Sean says, you know, the more people are polarized in these social networking websites, the more they kind of, you know, people want to distance themselves and, and that humiliating thing of deep threatening someone you know, comes, mm -hmm. in, comes into effect, you know. You don't want to be that person on there being a big jerk and being all polarizing and mean to everybody. Nobody, nobody likes that. Nobody wants to be around that. Uh, I know, you know, for myself, if I, you know, if I'm feeling particularly happy about a political event or something, and you know, just want to say, you know, I'm happy that Bill X Y Z passed, or I'm happy that candidate X Y Z got elected, and then somebody goes on there and just says a bunch of mean, nasty, polarized stuff, um, it kind of hurts. You know, it hurts and it makes me like that person less. So I, I would I would say that, that the uh, new social networking, uh, just based on kind of uh, you know peer approval and, and wanting to have friends and that human nature to want to be accepted, I would say that those things have a have a negative impact on polarization. Well, we live in a place that has a six day week and a seventy minute hour, the only place in the universe like that, um, and we're coming up on that seventy minute point. What I'd like to say first is, I think we will applause, not just for the speeches that they gave, but hey, these folks did something a lot of you wouldn't be willing to do, put yourself out there to question and answer. So let's give a round of applause for these folks. Thank you. I want to thank you all for, for, for coming to this event.